Thank you, Albert. Um, Melly and I have been friends for a long time, and she started to write for me at Book Forum um, a, a, a little food column. But what we share is that we both, I think, have rendered our own lard on more than one occasion, and it became something of a running joke. And we both also detest food writing, um, which I hope will become clear as I work through this piece. And I thought I would go, f go first. Um, we were working with a book uh, that um, is called uh, La Culinaire Francaise, um, which is a kind of compendium of, of old French recipes, mostly from the uh, end of the 19th century. And my partner, Rachel, also made this wonderful slideshow, which has everything and nothing to do with what we're looking at, although it does feature a lot of scenes of our preparing the, the two dishes that we, that we serve and that form the basis of, of both of our talks. Uh, the two dishes were œuf à la muscovite and canneton glacé au cerise, which I'll talk about a little bit as we, as we go forth. But one thing you should know is that the actual recipes from this book are not terribly helpful. Um, they're actually extremely unhelpful. They, don't tell you quite what to do with much of anything. In fact, we sent one to our, our friend Juliette um, Adams, who's here tonight, and helped us very much with the, with the presentation um, of, the, of the meal, which took a couple of days to, to make, um, because we couldn't figure out, there seemed to be a, a massive gap in the recipe, um, which, which had to do with how you put the duck back together after you cut it up. So anyway, I'm gonna start by reading a, a very quick passage from Muriel Sparks' novel, The Comforters of 1957. Um, it goes something like this. He was accustomed to Louise's food. Welks, periwinkles, milts and rows, chitterlings and sweetbreads, giblets, brains, and the tripes of ruminating animals. Louisa prepared them at long ease by many processes of effusion, diffusion, and immersion, requiring many pans of brine, many purifications and simmerings, much sousing and, sweet and sweetening by s uh, slow degrees. She sh uh, seldom brought an ordinary cut, or she seldom bought an ordinary cut or joint, and held that people who went through life ignoring the inward vitals of shells and beasts didn't know what was good for them. I'm gonna start also with a second little quote, just to begin which is, quote, the serious cook really must face up to the task. When Julia Child wrote these words, she was facing the task of killing a lobster. And of course, as every homeschooled chef or reader of David Foster Wallace knows, that involves a sharp knife wedged between the crustacean's antennae and the sharp downward flick of the wrist. I have admittedly, happily never dispatched with a lobster in this manner, although I know uh, that I am better off in general following whatever Julia Child advises. We all are. But we are not today considering the lobster, but rather livers and ducklings and eggs. Not the quick kill, but the long and the slow and the all but uh, already dead high cuisine that was once called the glory of French civilization. In any case, or in this case, uh, the task, of, uh, sorry, the facing up to the task involved an exercise in what I cannot expel from my system of culinary belief, however quaint, which is the fact that every cook of any seriousness must one day or another reckon with haute cuisine, must at least once answer to the sternest demands of the legacy of Escoffier, Prosper Montagnier, Urbain Dubois, and Ali Bop, in which to this point I had only dabbled. After all, if you can be made to feel that you're less of a cook and even less of a human being if you don't make your own ketchup, as Mark Bittman has on more than one occasion implied in the pages of the New York Times, what does it say of you, of you if you don't even know what sauce cardinal means, much less have attempted it? It was thus that I turned to my copy of L'Art Culinaire Francais, a fat compendium of classic cooking published in 1957 by Flammarion, not in 1959, as the typo-riddled email I sent to the organizers of tonight's event uh, implied, the same year as Muriel Sparks' novel, as it happens. I had bought the book on a rainy September two years ago at a flea market in the Loire town of Chinon. The stall was not very distant, in fact, from the statue of the village's uh, favorite gluttonous son, Francois Rabelais, born hungry a few kilometers away. You approach an overstuffed book like this and the bookseller who has put it out among her wares with a familiar mix of fascination and an off note of awkwardness, as you do the moment in French cuisine that uh, the, the book actually represents. I felt like a total tourist, in fact. I found that my oral felicity with the French language, which is fleeting on a good day, completely <laughs> deserted me, as I assumed the role of one who trafficked in 50-year-old cliches about the culture. Come now, dear, I'm sure the seller thought, as if the seller thought in a language more appropriate for a character in a spark novel, or maybe better something by Barbara Pym, rather than a weekend vendor of overpriced out-of-print books, books uh, about the same age as I. This is very disconcerting, by the way, because I think you're responding to what I'm reading rather than what's on the, the screen. Ah, okay. 
And furthermore, as if the seller possessed the native sense of superiority that was, of course, little more than yet another touristy cliche about the good people of rural France. You can't seriously propose making anything, anything of this cobwebbed relic. You couldn't if you wanted to. You just want this picture for the camp, book for the campy pictures. Now, I will admit that these pictures were part of the calling. They are drenched in color the way that publishers and filmmakers and TV executives and artists, both American and French, were mad for, for about a decade or so, roughly from the mid-1950s to the mid-1960s, a decade that encompassed the ludic, almost tawdry pigments of early Rothko and mid-career Hans Hoffman, of the seventh voyage of Sinbad, and the 5,000 fingers of Dr. T, of course, to the umbrellas of Cherbourg, ending perhaps in the pop purples and flaming oranges of TV's Batman. The cuisine as, adverti as advertised was almost color-filled cooking. It was is as if its photographer had been the, one to the first one to discover cyan, red, olive green, and all the shades of brown, from coffee to burnt skin to shit for the first time. La Culinaire Francaise is, ri is a riot of supersaturated photography with color schemes that might seem a bit de trop, even if they weren't found around the same time uh, that the most famous French artist of the moment, Yves Klein, was patenting his own pigment of IKB blue. The publisher Flammarion's desire for a, uh, for a lot of matte color makes these co compositions at times float independently of the formal arrangement of roast chickens and slabs of beef and whole fish swimming in a shallow bed of aspic. If the, uh, if the book La Culinaire Française uh, provided little more than food porn, it would have found a happy, quiet home once it had made it back with us to the United States on a bookshelf in New York, rarely to be read, much less consulted. But the visual sticking point worked its atavistic magic whenever I did pick it up, and the book transformed itself imperceptibly from a souvenir of an indulgent autumn spent fairly luxuriously in a fairy tale noir land of chateaus and chevres into a nagging, unfulfilled goal. I finally had made a rule after years of buying cookbooks that the proof of the pudding, as Brecht liked to say in English, is in the eating. Or as Cervantes put it, Alfredo de los huevos lo vera. You will see it when you fry the eggs. If I don't fry the eggs or stick my spoon in the pudding, the book must leave the premises. That's the rule. <laughs> to earn its bed and board, my fat little cookbook would have to deliver something in the way of two other senses, smell and taste. Though the two recipes that Melanie and I alighted upon, Urfa la Muscovy, an elaborately prepared set of eggs partially filled with caviar and decorated with anchovies and black truffles, of course, um, and Caneton glacé au cerise, dit Montmorency, a baby duck stuffed with a liver mousse and glazed with a meaty chauffois sauce, were real question marks in terms of whether they could dance on the nose and tongue to the same degree that they amused the eyes. There is an almost reflexive impulse to be silly and playful and purple in talking about these dishes. Guilty as charged. Most memorable food writing is rather famously suspended between the adjectivally indulgent and the appallingly sententious. It is a genre that at once takes itself far too seriously and not seriously enough. In this respect, I think few writers were as talented at addressing the built-in anxieties and contradictory needs of cookbook prose as the marvelously self-deflating Julia Child, which is why she was such a fabulous pioneer of televised cuisine as well. On the indulgent, sententious pendulum, La Culinaire swings decisively toward the latter, despite the free fantasy of the creations. It tells you that the egg should resemble a wine barrel, and that the liver mousse made of the spare flesh parts of the roasted baby duck, the offal that arrived with the rest of the bird, and an ancillary lobe of foie gras for good measure, should be shaped to look like the duck's stomach. And aside, um, neither Melanie nor I have any first-hand experience of a duck's tummy, and we were happy to wing it. <laughs> Yet the world of food it reveals, for all its ersatz wine, bell, wine barrels and fake stomachs and garnishes of, t of cherries and shaved truffle slices arranged like the spats on a tuxedo shirt, is nothing if not earnest. This is a cuisine that lets you know as soon as you read its instructions that it is far from frivolous as, imag as imaginable. It's not kidding around. So neither did we. If the suffer no fool's message of the recipes, if we want even to call these terse guidelines recipes, is somehow familiar to any home chef, there is something refreshingly archaic about the way in which the procedures for preparing the eggs and the duck insist on their culinary probity. This is a rare treat in our less refined time of DYI kitchen manners and YouTube help with the hard part. Half the time we didn't even know if we were doing it right and Google couldn't be of any assistance, which itself was quite liberating in its odd way. The mousse barely set, and the aspects threatened to turn into a watery slush. Yet the duck was resplendent, and for a moment I got just why you would want your eggs overflowing with caviar to look like barrels of wine. It was a momentary peek at a cuisine that approved of barrels of wine, of overflow, of engorged cherries poached in Bordeaux for good measure. 
It approved most certainly of using an adjective like resplendent. When else would it be okay to write a word like that? And how would you know, like those who ate Louisa's food, that it was apparently good for you? The livery, barely still foie duck, uh, provided the both of us with a sort of comforting answer. Thanks. I have to say, uh, well, I think Eric saw this slideshow already, but I haven't, so um, it's very entertaining. Um, okay. In the weeks since Eric and I embarked on our madcap mid-century French culinary adventure, I've considered numerous topics for this evening. Like most writers, I'm sorry to say, ever hopeful of beating the deadline and ever thwarted, I even found myself thinking about what I'd write before Eric and I met for stage one of our project, which involved what I'll loosely term grocery shopping for a list of ingredients so decadent as to be comic. Foie gras, caviar, a large truffle, and several ducks. I would write about French cooking after the war, I thought, or something to do with MFK Fisher and the gastronomical me, or how much I loved the way Julia Child set a dining table on her PBS show, which I watched obsessively when I was a kid, and which probably has at least something to do with why I'm standing here right now. But when it was all over and done with, when Eric and I had passed an afternoon downtown buying the goods for the Canetan and the Oeuf à la Moscovite, stopping along the way for smoked fish sandwiches at Russ and Daughters, which we ate wandering around in the street like tourists in our own hometown, when we had idled at length, thanks to Eric's exceptional advance reconnaissance, in a tiny wonder cabinet of a store on Avenue B called SOS Chefs, where we browsed edible gold dust and limited edition truffle slicers and could easily have stayed for a week. Once we had spent the entire following day together in Eric's kitchen with aforementioned ducks, and I believe there were some good shots of that, which we greasily disassembled and then reassembled using a, as spackle a foie gras, shallot, and duck liver mousse Eric had whipped up, when more puff pastry disasters than I care to number had taken place, and Rachel, the creator of this mesmerizing slideshow, had come home and been dragged immediately into our Gallic frenzy. After our friends had arrived wearing cake and wine and good cheer, had eaten and in one case had charmingly and in perfect French read out loud the ridiculously incomplete recipes from l'art culinaire français par nos grands maîtres de la cuisine for dramatic effect, which we somehow felt we needed, as though cooking a meal that included poaching cherries in Bordeaux, giving them fake stems made out of chives, and decorating caviar-stuffed boiled eggs with anchovies and truffle dots to look like wine barrels, and having a long, serious conversation with a butcher at the 11th hour about just what the hell we were doing was not dramatic enough. When all of this was over, I realized that none of these things was the thing to write about. The thing to write about was aspic. <laughs> which I'm glad to see Eric also could not help but bring up. Aspic is about expectations, or at least it is when two people who are not classically trained French chefs undertake it. True, the same could be said of pretty much everything Eric and I decided to cook. A random sample of conversation from any moment of our cooking day would go more or less like this. Eric, have you ever made this before? Me, no. Have you ever made this? Eric, no followed by a moment of very complicated silence before we turned back to our respective tasks. But the aspic, whether it was owing to inexperience or hubris, I'll never know, but we left our aspics plural, a cherry flavored one for the duck and a shrimp flavored one for the eggs until too late in the day. The result of this was that having completed all of the tasks on our list that might have made a more self-aware pair of people nervous, did I mention the disassembling and reassembling of roasted birds? It all came down to what was essentially fancy jello. I don't know what our hopes were for our excursion into the art of French cooking, and they were certainly lowered just a tad by our realization late in the game that the photos in our cookbook had definitely been doctored. <laughs> but we were calm throughout. That our ducks did not even vaguely resemble the ones in the book seemed not to matter that our sides of blanched sauteed white asparagus and simple boiled potatoes would most definitely not be approved 
by the grand maître de la cuisine, who went in for things like elaborately patterned vegetable terrines and little pastry baskets filled with carefully sculpted baby carrots, didn't give us pause. But the idea that the aspic might not set, well, that was somehow de trop, just way, way too much to deal with. And so our guests found us, as guests sometimes do in my experience, slightly agitated about the state of the meal. As we all drank white wine and champagne in the living room, Eric and I took turns drifting off to the refrigerator to jiggle the aspic platters and pray a little. Then we would hold brief harried consults next to the stove while everyone else politely averted their eyes. <laughs> Things remained sloshy until about 9 p.m. when we finally gave in and realized that if we didn't start eating soon, we'd all be digesting our duck liver and cream and caviar until well into the next day. We settled each oeuf a la Moscovite into its artichoke bottom in an orange ceramic dish, and then it was shrimp aspic time. And it was good. The aspic, bearer of all our neuroses, had done its thing at last, and we carried it and the eggs nestled into it to the table with a flourish. Amen. I'll spare you the blow-by-blow -blow of the cherry aspic and how we hacked it up to place under the ducks and whether or not anybody actually ate it, though I vaguely remember about 16 glasses of wine in, Eric mumbling something to me about how he thought it tasted weird. <laughs> But what I do want to say about aspic is this, that it was a luxury to worry about it. When you're making dinner for a group of people who are there, yes, for your stunt cooking, but who you know will be just as happy if you all wind up ordering pizza to drink with the incredible wine they've brought, it is easy, very easy, to let your mind run wild over something as inconsequential as gelatin. When your husband arrives for dinner with flowers and wearing a beautiful shirt, looking for all the world like a happy suitor, and apparently finding it completely normal to be a guest at his own wife's dinner party at someone else's house, you become very aware of your place in the world and that it is fortunate, truffles or no truffles. <clears throat> when you bring your slightly ridiculous ducks on their beds of questionable aspect to the table, and it is crowded with people you want to talk to and hear talking to each other all night long, you have, in short, absolutely nothing to fear, not even aspic. Aspic, you see, is not just about expectation. It's about transformation, which also happens to be exactly what happens when you gather a collection of good people around a table, sit back, and wait to see what transpires, what you'll learn about them by the end of the night, and, most mysteriously, what you'll learn about yourself. This alchemy, I think, is what the fantastic Jean-Antelme Brillat Savarin was talking about in The Physiology of Taste, published in 1825, when he wrote that the pleasures of the table are for every man of every land, and no matter of what place in history or society. There was no way I was going to make it through this whole thing without dragging in at least one legitimate French culinary authority. And in fact, I'm even going to let this one have the last word about pleasure, that most valuable of commodities, even more precious than gold dust or foie gras. The pleasures of the table, he wrote, and I wished suddenly, as I read it again, that I could have this embroidered on my heart, can be a part of all our other pleasures, and they last the longest to console us when we have outlived the rest. <laughs>